Corbin Schultz is about to enter her fifth year of owning Rainbow Roots Farm in Iowa City. She graduated from the University of Iowa in the pre-med track and decided her interest was in preventable medicine instead of getting involved in a system with many flaws. Corbin grows 60 varieties of vegetables and delivers to places like New Pioneer Co-op, Basta Restaurant, and Get Fresh. She'll be speaking on the local food system and ways small-scale farmers are paving the way with little support from the government. I am personally totally stoked to hear about this. Uh, welcome, Corbin. Thank you so much. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Um, so this is a really awesome opportunity for me because I, this is the reason I got into farming was to educate um, the community on the food system and to change the way that, that we look at food and appreciate food. Um, so I'm Corbin Schultz. I own Rainbow Roots Farm. Um, before we get started, oops, I want to, um, do a quick disclaimer that the history of the food system in the U.S. is so incredibly complex, and I could never, um, spend enough time talking about it, and each of these slides I'm about to show could be its own presentation, um, so just bear with me on the generalization I'm doing, um, for time. And also, um, a tr a one trigger warning is that I will be discussing slavery, colonization, and exploitation within the food system. Um, and when I say exploitation, I mean um, taking full use of a resource, which could be a something or a someone, unfairly in order to benefit from it. Um, so let's chat a little bit of history. Um, Native Americans started farming around 7,000 years ago. Um, they started farming in what is present day Illinois. Um, they were able to support about three times as many people per acre than the modern European farming that happens now. Um, and they did a really good job of working with the land. So reducing tillage um, and plowing. So the soil health was really incredible. Um, and creating good ecosystems around the farm as well. Um, then we had the, the colonizers come over um, and basically take control of the whole entire country. Um, they, you know, it was a mass genocide and they, one of the big things they did was they started killing off the bison which were um, the Native Americans used their bones for tools, their ligaments for ropes and ties, their meat for food, their hides for clothing and warmth and shelter. And that is what actually ended the Indian Wars and forced Native Americans into their um, reservations. Um, then with the... Um, with cotton becoming essential to the um, continued growth of the country's um, economy, they said, let's exploit some people. And we, um, we had a huge, huge number of enslaved people sent over from mainly Africa um, to do the work completely for free and which this system actually set up the same exact ag system that we're using today. So a huge amount of exploitation is still within the system. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it begins here. Um, and then after the Civil War sharecropping started, which basically was a landowner allows a tenant, which is usually a lower income person person or family um, to use the land in exchange for a share of their crop. So landlords would lease um, equipment, offer seeds, fertilizer, food, and other supplies um, on credit, and then hope to get, you know, paid back upon harvest. But a lot of the times the high interest rates, the unpredictable harvest, and the unethical landlords often kept tenant families severely indebted to them. So they would have to keep carrying over the debt year to year and actually like prevented them from ever leaving. So that was another form of slavery um, 
and it made it impossible for the tenants to sell their crop to anyone except for the landowner. Um, so then um, we have small family farms, which actually began with um, once the Civil War was over, the country started giving out land either for free or extremely um, inexpensively to most like white families, basically. And this was the first step of of um, the amount of white landowners we have today. Um, and then Earl Butts was a secretary of agriculture under Ronald Reagan, or um, yeah, Ronald Reagan. And he basically said, get bigger, get out, farm fence row to fence row. So this was the boom of the industrial agriculture movement. And basically, um, you know, farm as much as you can in a small amount of space, regard like disregarding everything else besides the, the financial benefit it will have for us. Um, and then that's how the USDA started giving subsidies to different um, different parts of the ag system. So um, we have just, this is very general. It's a very generalized um, image, but you have corporate control, which are ma major companies controlling US agriculture. You have the farm owner who owns the land or the farm business and or. You have the employee who works under the landowner. You have the plant animal, which is the, the thing that's being farmed. And then you have land, which includes air quality, soil health, any of the environmental um, um, uh, any of the environmental stuff that comes with using the land. So um, when I say corporate control, I mean that there are there's such a concentration um, in agriculture of who controls prices and markets for farmers. Um, so they contract farmers to grow for them, but they control the the um, profit margin. So they can they control all the seeds. So they control how much the seeds cost for the farmer. They control how much the farmer can sell their food for. And it creates this really um, toxic environment of farmers are basically always working to pay off, you know, the seeds they bought in the beginning of the year, which is keeping them growing for these corporate companies. Um, and if they're not growing for corporate companies, then they end up having to compete with these companies, which is also really hard. Um, and these companies, they fund PACs with Congress to sway bills and elect candidates. So um, they have a huge, 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 um, they have huge control over the USDA because of this. Um, and that's where the subsidies end up going um, and everything like that. So the graphic on the right shows the top four companies um, uh, control. So they control 84% of beef production, 66% of hog production, 59% of poultry, and so on. So you can see how um, controlled it is. You have the farm owner, which is the owner of the farm business and or land. 60% um, of farmland owners in Iowa don't farm. Um, an average, the average age of farmers is nearly 60 years old, and 95% of farmers are white in the U.S. 64% um, are male, and in Iowa, it, farmers are only 9% of the labor force. You have employees, which is 1.3% um, of U.S. employee um, of U.S. employment are farm workers. Um, immigrant farm workers make up 73% of that. And even with increased wages and benefits, American citizens don't want to do this work. So we're super reliant on Im immigrant workers and it's becoming harder and harder for us to find those workers because Mexico has started to treat ag workers better. So they're not traveling to work. Um, and these farm labor shortages in the US is a big reason that we import fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, plants and animals. So 99% of farmed animals in the U.S. are factory farmed. And when I say factory farmed, I mean um, rearing of livestock using intensive methods 
um, and are confined indoors under um, strictly controlled conditions. 80% of antibiotics sold in the U.S. is for animal agriculture. In Iowa, we export 90% of what we grow. And then there are only two laws regarding farm animal welfare, and they are in transportation and slaughter. And this all excludes poultry. Um, when I talk about land, um, there's a huge um, climate disaster and environmental injustice happening. Um, U.S. agriculture is among the top reasons for climate change and industrial farm waste and practices are creating a poisonous world. Um, they're creating the climate change and then they're in the path of the climate destruction, which then adds to the climate, adds to the reason the climate is so unhealthy and getting um, devastated. And also lower income folks are in the line of fire. So affordable housing options are always in um, areas with pollution, are in areas with really poor water quality and stuff like that. Um, so let's dig in if we weren't already. Um, so large-scale corn, soy, and grain farm, the hierarchy, they have corporate control. There's a farm owner. The employees generally, besides some, um, you know, a lot of times family helps out, but employees were replaced with massive um, equipment. Um, and then that ends up exploiting the land because you're, you have runoff, you're spraying pesticides that, um, you know, um, they like fight off the pollinator habitat as well. And a lot of, you know, we need pollinators to pollinate more than half of the stuff that we eat. Um, you have large scale livestock, the farm hierarchy, where you have corporate control, the farm owner, then you have an exploited employee, which work under unsafe and unhealthy conditions and are paid very little. Um, you have the plant or the animal that is exploited because of the conditions they're living in. Um, and then you have the land is exploited because the amount of animals in one concentrated area, there's no way that the environment could clear that, like all of that waste has to go somewhere and it's going to affect the whole, the communities and the environment around the, those operations. Um, then you have large scale conventional vegetable and fruit. Um, farms and they have the same lineup. Um, the employees exploited because of the labor, and that comes from the days of slavery. So um, they're paid, you know, 10 cents for a, a five gallon bucket of whatever they harvest. It's like incredibly low wages. And then you have the land that's exploited because it's they're farming in the same way that large scale corn, soy, and grain farmers are farming with um, chemicals, plowing and tilling the land, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have small local farm hierarchy where there's no corporate control. You have employees, the crops or animals and the land treated ethically, but the farm owners exploited. And when I say that, I mean that there's no access to health care. The profit margin is so small that a lot of farmers have to have off farm jobs if they don't have family land or um, like a partner that has an off farm job. Um, so because of that, small scale farms are dying. Beginning or farmers are burning out after five to 10 years of production. Um, and then those beginning farmers that are coming in to fill their shoes, they can't you know, they can't farm a six acre farm right off the bat. So they are taking five to 10 years to fill those shoes. And then those same beginning farmers are burning out after that amount of time. So it's a crazy vicious cycle. And that's why our local food system isn't growing. It's staying the same. Um, and so where do we fit in as rainbow roots? Um, we are a six acre vegetable farm located four miles north of Iowa City. Um, we sell through a CSA and to um, New Pie and some restaurants in the downtown area. Um, we're queer, women-owned, and young farmer-operated. 
And to dig into that a little bit, um, our farming practices, we are certified organic through the Midwest Organic Service Agency, um, which is accredited by the USDA. We also went above that and got certified through the Real Organic Project, which basically um, it's like a real organic logo because what's happening in industrial operations is they're finding loopholes and ways to get certified that are not real um, organic um, standards. So there's a lot of um, even corruption happening within the organic label. So we went beyond and got certified through the Real Organic Project. Um, we spread 70 tons of compost on our fields every fall. Um, we plant cover crops, which keep our land, um, which keep our soils covered during the winter to reduce erosion and runoff. And we also reduce tillage to keep our soil biology um, healthy and intact. We also plant a lot of pollinator habitat around the farm. Um, we have two pigs that we use for veggie scrap consumption. We produce about hundreds, um, 200 pounds of veggie scraps a week. Um, and then they also um, will rotate them to do some field prep and fertilization as well. Um, we are really into supporting other local producers. So we partner with other producers to do a Thanksgiving share. And we also um, work with other producers who do bread, eggs, flowers, sweet corn, microgreens, and honey to create like more of a full diet experience for our customers. Um, and by doing this, by sharing customers, it actually helps all of us do better. Um, and the reason we want to support each other is because we never, ever, ever look at each other as competition. We know that our competition is the organic food section at Walmart and it's not, and it's high V it's not other local producers doing this work because from even out of all the producers in this area, there's not even enough food to feed everyone that lives in Iowa city alone. So we work together, we share what crops work really well for us, what planting date works really well for us. Um, it's really awesome. Um, something that's sweet about our farm is that CSA pickup is on the farm, not in a drive through setting. So we encourage you to park your car, get out, have a conversation with the farmer, um, walk the farm to connect to the land that like your food is grown on. Um, we do a really, we focus really hard on making sure our newsletters are educational and, um, making sure that everyone knows exactly what's going on, even the bad stuff, because things happen all the time that are out of our control. And it's super risky to do this work. Um, and also we have some, that's, those are our sweet pigs that I spoke about in the last slide. And then we also have awesome barn cats that people like to visit with. Um, we grow a lot of uncommon crops. So we grow okra. Um, we figured out a way to make artichokes an annual crop here. Usually they're perennial crops in California and on the West Coast, um, but we put them through a three-week vernalization, which tricks them into thinking they went through a winter. And then we get these cute little artichokes um, on the first year of production. Um, we grow sweet habaneros, which are habaneros without the spice. We grow a lot of tomatillos, a perfect blend of cherry tomatoes. We do a lot of other specialty peppers. We grow striped eggplant and yellow watermelon. And this is just along with the other 60 varieties of normal crops that we grow. Um, we are really, I'd like to say, heavily involved in the community. So we have been in the Pride Parade. We do field trips, presentations like this one. Um, we donate um, 10 to 15,000 pounds of veggies every season. Um, we do farm tours and local foodie events like the Farm to Street Dinner and Taste of Iowa City. Um, we create an open and accepting environment, not only for all of our crew members, but for anyone who steps foot on the farm. We also hope for the safety and happiness of everyone we feed and work with in the community. And it's important to us to demonstrate the success of a queer business in Iowa City. 
um, show the show kids and the community how um, viable it is and how important it is for that representation. Um, so our farm, our farming dream is to have affordable land access for young BIPOC queer and beginning farmers. And this is really, really important to me because for the five years that I've been farming with this business, I have had to lease land every year, which um, allows me to not build any equity. So if I basically, if I stopped farming, everything I've done, I would have, I basically wouldn't make any money from it. Um, from all the work I've put into it, I would only have my depreciated assets that would help me move on to the next thing. Um, so it's really important to get land access, long-term affordable land access to farmers starting. Um, even owning land has stopped us from being able to plant perennial crops that take three to 10 years to be ready for harvest and stuff like that. So it really hinders our growth. Um, our second thing is cooperative farming with other local producers. So we already do a lot of this, but maybe getting even more in depth with it, um, equipment sharing, um, sharing land, or even sharing a business structure. Um, I think that's the way. It, to me, it feels like the food system is the sinking Titanic and each individual farm, local farm is like scooping out bucket, like five gallon buckets. And it just seems like, you know, we're just a drop in a, in a bucket of like sinking ship. Um, so being able to cooperate and become more viable working together is a really big dream for us. Um, another thing is to create a wholesome and ethical food system on all levels. So as you've seen since the 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 one of the first slides on slavery is that our food system is still built around that exploitation. And so and the, the system isn't broken. It's built exactly the way that it was meant to be built. So what we need to do is start a new system, build it from the ground up. And I think that starts with local farmers like us. Um, and then also to spread knowledge and awareness on the current food system. Um, and, and some ways we can change the system together is help build policies through local and federal government to get local food into institutions like hospitals, schools, um, and on everyone's plates. Um, support local every time you can. Um, getting a CSA, which I mentioned before, um, is kind of like a subscription service to a farm, but it helps you share the risk of farming. So you'll pay up front for, you know, a certain number of weeks of vegetables. And that helps the farmer, one, get money up front for buying seeds, compost, irrigation supplies, animal feed, labor up front. Um, and then it also shares the risk. So if the derecho came through again and wiped out our whole tomato crop again, um, we would we wouldn't lose anything from that. And neither would you because um, you, you would get a box full of other things that weren't tomatoes. And I would have the same amount of income as if we did have tomatoes. The derecho was so out of our control and so was the pandemic. And the CSA model was the only way that we were able to withstand both of those things. Um, four is to help human food farmers access land, like I mentioned in the last slide. Um, financial aid for startup costs, it can start anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000 just to start up bare minimum with, you know, if you're talking livestock, you need to buy the livestock, you need to buy the fencing, you need to get, make sure they have irrigation and water. Feed is super expensive. And for a lot of livestock like cows, it's two years until you see that profit. Um, if you're talking vegetable farmers, you know, we need greenhouse, irrigation supplies, potting soil, seeds, labor. Um, so that startup cost is a huge reason why we don't have a lot of farmers um, getting into this work. Um, and then educate, educate, educate. Make sure that you know the system that you're um, you're in every day. And, you know, you need a farmer three times a day. And I think we forget about that. Um, at every meal. Um, here are some 
um, where I got some of the information and also um, for you to learn more on your own if you're interested. And then thank you. And I'm open to questions.